For the word of God that we're going to focus on, no, excuse me, focus on this morning comes from Matthew chapter 17. We're going to look at the nine verses that we just heard read uh, in the gospel. There are, on page eight, there's a section on the bottom. If you'd like to take notes during the sermon, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. Are you a good listener? Are you the kind of person that when someone's talking to you, you put down everything and you look at that person in the eye, you listen intently because what they're saying is important, you take it to heart and you go and do it? Or are you the kind of listener who says, oh yeah, yeah, sure, uh-huh, yep, sounds good. What did you say? Why didn't you do that? I wasn't, oh, I wasn't listening. You're the kind of listener that things go in one ear and out the other. You listen as long as what that person is telling you uh, agrees with your viewpoint of things or what you want to do, but if it's different, maybe just ignore it. <coughs> Are you a good listener? Are you a good listener when it comes to Jesus and his word? When Jesus says something in his word, when you read it and you hear it, do you, do you hear, listen to it and then take it to heart and believe it and carry it out if necessary? Or do you hear Jesus' words and, and, and listen to them as long as it matches up with what you want or your worldview or what you think? But if there's a clash, you just ignore it. Jesus' disciples had a hard time listening to him. They heard the things they wanted to hear from him. But when their viewpoint of what the Messiah should do or who he should be or what he should say, when that clashed with the reality... They didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. Before this section in, in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus was with his disciples, his 12 disciples, and he asked them, who do people say I am? It's not because Jesus was ignorant of it, but he wanted to draw out of their, their heart and their mouth a confession of faith. This was really about the, the, those 12 disciples. What did they believe about him? So the 12 disciples answered a variety of things, the things that they had heard from people. Did we think Jesus is this guy or this guy? And then he looked at them and, and asked, who do you say I am? And Peter, who's one of Jesus' 12 disciples, the, the one who's often the spokesman of the group, stepped forward and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, exactly. This was revealed to you by God. Well done, Peter. Great job. And then Jesus explained to them what the Messiah was going to do. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So Jesus says this in response to what Peter had confessed. This, Jesus says, is what the Messiah has come to do. You say, I'm the Messiah, Peter. This is what I'm going to do. This is the mission of the Son of God. To come to this earth, to give up his life, to free humanity from sin, death, and the devil. It shouldn't have been a mystery to the twelve disciples that the Messiah would do this. If you look at the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, which is all about pointing ahead to the Messiah, it's descriptions of the Messiah. You, you look through the Old Testament, you can paint a very accurate picture of what the Messiah would do and what he would say. This shouldn't have been a mystery to them. But this is not the kind of Messiah Peter wanted. You know, Peter wanted the water into wine, the walking on water, the, the giving sight to the blind, the raising the dead Jesus. That's the kind of stuff that Peter wanted. That's the Messiah. We want the spectacular. We, we want the, the big time. We want you to just do miracle, miracle, miracle. Just do all those wonderful things. It doesn't match up with his worldview. This is the Messiah should do, and yet this is what he hears from the Messiah. Why do we want weakness when we can have this power? Why do we want humility when we can have the glory? Peter said that. He heard Jesus say those words. He said to him, Lord, no, 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 this is never going to happen. May this never happen to you. May you never go and suffer. May you never go and give up your life. May you never rise from the dead. Lord, no, don't do that. And then Jesus, in response, said to him, get behind me, Satan. 
You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. With all that going on, six days later, Jesus did this. This is Matthew chapter 17. We're going to look at the first five verses. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is God's word. The same picture that I showed the kids earlier. There were, no, there were no cell phone. Peter didn't bring his cell phone up the mountain that day, I guess, to take a picture and capture it for all eternity. Jesus didn't hire a painter that day to come and do a portrait of what was going on. So here's a, one artist's rendition of many. But you, you kind of get an idea of what Matthew just described, although very, very slim glimmer. In the middle, you have Jesus. And, and Jesus, to all accounts throughout the course of his life, his ministry looked like any other man. There was nothing spectacular about him that you would have stopped, like, oh, wow, look at, oh, that, he was just an ordinary man. But that day, it's almost like Jesus pulled back the curtain of his humanity, or he, he allowed that divine nature that he possesses, he, he allowed it to shine through. His face, his clothes, all of it was, was bright and gleaming like the sun. He showed his disciples who he really is. I'm, he's God. They knew it, but now they got to see it. And then and two people appeared with him, two men, two figures from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, two great prophets who have been dead for hundreds of years, appeared there on the mountain with him. And then, and then, a cloud descended over the mountain, a bright cloud, and enveloped that mountain, and a voice came from the cloud saying, what? This is my son, my love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. There you go, Peter. There's the spectacular. There's the glory. There's the majesty. There's everything you wanted. And then Matthew tells us what Peter and James and John were doing. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Not rejoicing. It was terrifying. They were standing in his presence, cheering him on. They were face down on the ground, cowering in fear. We'll talk about that in just a second. What we want to focus on are those words that came from the cloud, the voice of God. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When God looks at his son, He's pleased with everything he does. Jesus has been conducting his ministry, his life on earth, or his ministry on earth, I should say, for two years. He's been on earth for close to over 30 years. Throughout that entire time, his father has been pleased with him. Job well done. This is his way of, of affirming everything Jesus has said, everything Jesus has done. It is perfect, it is wonderful. It's like when your boss comes up to you and says, hey, I really love the work you've been doing recently. Keep up the good work. It makes you want to go to work the next day. Wow, good, I love being noticed. Amplify that to the nth degree. Jesus, the divine Son of God, the eternal Son of God, who has been around before time began and exists all the way past time, God from God, light from light, God is pleased with everything His Son has done. That's why he says, listen to him. Dear friends, we want to listen to the word. Listen to that word that is spoken by God. Whatever Jesus says, listen to it, take it to heart. Because God is pleased with everything he has done. When Jesus says, pray, and trust that your Father in heaven hears you, and answers you according to his good and gracious will, and gives only good gifts to his children, listen to it. Take it to heart. 
When Jesus says to his people, he says to his followers, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Listen to it, take it to heart. When Jesus says to you that your sins are forgiven, they have been removed as far as the east is from the west. You do not have to pay for your guilt. Listen, take it to heart and believe it. And when Jesus says that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and rise from the dead, disciples, take it to heart. Listen to it. Believe it. Dear friends, there is nothing that Jesus has said that we could just ignore, we should gloss over, or we should think, well, I'm going to have to listen to that part. Everything Jesus says, God is pleased with it. Everything Jesus does, God loves it. That's why we listen to the word. But we also want to listen to that word for strength. With him I am well pleased. You know what love languages are? You ever read that book by Gary Chapman? Yeah, some of you don't want to know. But the, it's a concept, it's an idea that, that people want or receive love in different ways. So if you're at my house, my relationship with my wife, I can say, I love you, honey, I love you, I love you, I love you, and she'll say, well, I love you back. But you know what means a lot to her is when I'm sitting on the couch, I got one baby in this arm, and I got another baby in this arm, and I'm reading a book. That's when she'll snuggle up close. That's when she'll take pictures. Because for her, it's, it's acts of service. It's being engaged and involved. That's how I show her my love. That's how she receives love. For me, it's words of affirmation. So if you ever want to express your love to me, just affirm what I'm doing. If you ever... If you ever want to hate me, just say nothing to me and I'll assume the worst. No. <laughs> but what God is saying here to his son, are words of affirmation. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is God. He's eternal. He's perfect. But he's also 100% human. He needs to hear this from his father for strength. He needs to hear this for what's about to take place. The Gospel writer Luke says that after this episode at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus descended the mountain and he, had a, he, he, he set his jaw towards Jerusalem. He had this steely-eyed resolve to go and do what he had been sent to do. This word from the Father empowered him, it strengthened him to continue doing what he had been asked by his Father to do. Dear friends, this word that Jesus, that God the Father spoke to his son is also for you, for your strength. These words, dear friends, are spoken to you as well. You know, we don't deserve to hear these words. The words that we ought to hear from God are, you are not my son, you are not my daughter. What you do displeases me. I'm not in love with you. I want nothing to do with you because of your sin. And yet that's not what God says to you or me. What he says to you is you are my son, you are my daughter, with you I am well pleased. That happened the first time in your baptism. In fact, we had it inscribed on our baptism bowl, with you I am well pleased. It's there that whether as a child or as an adult, God looks at you through his son and says, I am pleased with you. When there in baptism, God covers you with his son, that Savior Jesus, who was absolutely perfect, who has taken away all of your sins, that Savior Jesus covers you. When God looks at you, he sees his son and he marvels and applauds what you have done. When you hear those words on a Sunday morning, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's God looking at you saying, I am pleased with you. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. It, it, it's kind of like the, the, the pictures when you know, parents post pictures of some big event in a child's life, a graduation, um, some kind of an accomplishment. Post the pictures in the little caption, we are so proud of what she has accomplished in life. When you read that as a child, as a kid, oh man, it's strengthening. Dear friends, run back to this word for your strength. God is pleased with you through Jesus Christ. You are his child, and he loves you dearly. Listen to the word, the word that's spoken. But now we've got to get back to this whole 
fear thing. Because that's where we left Peter, James, and John. On the ground, afraid. But Jesus does something spectacular, something amazing, something gracious. Take a look at verse, verse 7, verse 8. Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. The voice silenced. Cloud dissipated. God's visible presence was, was gone. And the light did not shine through Jesus. He covered it back up. <coughs> And all they saw was Jesus. And now Jesus is going to do something amazing. Now that his disciples had seen who he is, they had experienced that moment in heaven, they had left terrified, Jesus covered it all up, and now he's going to do something amazing. He's going to descend that mountain. And he's not going to go back and just give sight to a few blind people, raise a couple dead people, turn some more water into wine, and be done with it. He's not going to descend the mountain and give them more answers to life's mysteries. They couldn't handle his bare glory. He's not going to do that. No, he's going to descend that mountain of transfiguration. He's going to war. The Son of God is going to take all of his power, all of his might, all of his glory, everything that he is, everything that he possesses, and he's going to go to war. For you. He's going to go fight against our great enemies of sin, Satan, and the devil. Or sin, Satan, and death. Enemies that you and I have, have fallen prey to, enemies that have harmed us, enemies that have hurt us, enemies that we cannot defeat. The Son of God is going to go and defeat them. And he stands there in front of the, the Jewish ruling council and the high priests, and he stands there meek and silent. And meek and silent. That same one who is meek and silent standing there is the one who crushes Satan's head and destroys his power. When he hangs on a cross and he looks defeated, people gather around him, taunting him and laughing him with the word finished and giving up his life. He breaks the chains of sin. And three days later, he comes out of the grave triumphant, alive, glorious, the conquering hero, destroys the power that death has over us forever. Dear friends, listen to the word, the word in action. Watch what he does for you, your Savior Jesus. The one that's there on that mountaintop is the one who goes to Calvary's cross. That same Jesus who did that for his disciples then and today is the same Jesus who's with us. The Jesus who's with you and me on the mountaintop of life, right? When we have those, when life is going great and it is grand and it is wonderful, of course Jesus is there. That's why Peter said, how good were it to be here. This is wonderful. But that same Jesus who's there on the mountaintop is the same Jesus who is with us in the valley. When it doesn't look good, when things look horrible, when it looks like defeat is imminent, Jesus is there, too, with all of his power. And remember what he did when it looked like he was defeated, when everything was going awful. He was just destroying sin, Satan, and death for you. Dear friends, listen to the word who fought for you. Why would he ever deceive you when he died for you? Listen to the word. Why would he ever lead you, to lead you astray when he's leading you to heaven? Listen to the word. Why would he ever stop loving you? He has loved you to death, to the grave and back again. Dear friends, listen. Listen to the word. Amen.